So yeah, I want to first thank you, Philip, for uh, setting up this meeting and also for your help in uh, designing the content uh, for the talk. And I also wanted to thank uh, JJ uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to everybody today about uh, intellectual property pitfalls and how to avoid them. As uh, Philip mentioned, I'm uh, Mike Burns. I have been a patent attorney for nearly a decade. In the uh, first uh, six years of my career, I was uh, working at uh, Kenobi Martins, which is a national IP law firm that has a large office here in Orange County. And at Kenobi Martins, I was doing mostly uh, patent prosecution. <clears throat> and patent prosecution is the uh, negotiating process where, as the lawyer, I negotiate on behalf of the inventor with uh, the patent office, usually an ex like an examiner at the patent office. And the examiner and I negotiate back and forth, and the goal is for me to get the inventor uh, an issued patent. Uh, then... Uh, you know, after six years at Kenobi, I went into my own private practice and I still do mostly patent prosecution, but I also do a little bit of uh, trademark work and uh, licensing work as well. And in this talk, I'll cover uh, some aspects of licensing uh, and also some of the general things about uh, patent prosecution and uh, the other uh, intellectual property uh, areas. <clears throat> So my first warning here actually is to myself, this little warning uh, button up here, uh, because I have to give my disclaimer, which is that although I'm an attorney, I am not your attorney. If you need an attorney, though, feel free to contact me. Uh, um, the general, this is not legal advice, this is just a general overview of intellectual property. And the general rules are always, uh, there's exceptions to them, there's conditions that have to be met for one general rule to apply versus another. So I'm just going to highlight some of those areas. But then certainly whenever a specific topic comes up, you'd want to consult a patent attorney because, or an IP attorney so that they can kind of get a sense of whether the general rule is going to apply or not. <clears throat> So with that in mind, um, let me just move on to what I mean when I'm referring to intellectual property. So intellectual property are, is like uh, ideas or thoughts that um, can be protected by following a certain process. And if that uh, process is followed correctly, uh, the idea or knowledge can be kind of converted into like property in a legal sense in that, you know, those ideas and concepts could be, uh, you know, sold or uh, licensed, or you, a lot of times property has like an exclusionary aspect to it where you could prevent others from coming onto your property. Uh, so each of these areas that I have highlighted here on this like realm of intellectual property, that's what you'll get if you follow different processes. Like, for example, uh, just to take one, the copyrights. If you uh, create an original work, uh, then your copyright rises, the natu ri rises naturally. But <clears throat> that is not the case, for example, with patents. With patents, uh, uh, you need to actually file your application and interact with the examiner to get an issued patent. Your, your idea isn't protected until you have an actual uh, patent. Uh, but going back to copyright for just a second, uh, if you, although your copyright, copyright might arise naturally, if you go to sue somebody, you will find out that you need to first register your copyright before you can uh, litigate on, on the copyright or sue, enforce it. <clears throat> And to do that, there's a process that you go through for copyright registration. Uh, trademarks the same way. Uh, you uh, uh, follow what process to register a trademark, which is different than the process you follow for registering a patent. But they're similar in that you're interacting with the patent office and uh, with a patent examiner uh, or with an examiner. Um, then uh, Trade secrets, the reason why I have this protect IP rights uh, kind of warning blog here is each of these things are different. Like, for example, trade secrets, you have to, in order to enforce a trade secret, you really have to have tried to keep it a secret. Uh, so the company or the person who owns a trade secret has to take some affirmative steps to like limit access to it or kind of 
uh, you know, maintain confidentiality of it. It's, it's uh, once, uh, you know, if, for example, if you sue somebody for misappropriation of trade secrets, they could try to show that you haven't treated it like a trade secret. Uh, you know, you were emailing these things, these customer lists to everybody or something along those lines. Um, Know-how is not uh, anything you would register, but that's maybe some technical uh, expertise you have on uh, making something work. And you usually could accompany it, for example, with some patent uh, licensing or something like that. But you can still protect know-how through confidentiality agreements and uh uh, things like that. Uh, it's just know how it's kind of like um, a lesser strong trade secret. You, trade secrets you really have to maintain as a secret. Know how you could still protect sometimes with confidentiality agreements and things like that. Um, and as I uh, just mentioned, trademarks is a source, ident or maybe I didn't mention this, but tr trademarks is a source identifier. So you kind of accumulate your rights with trademarks through use. Uh, that's why uh, somebody buying, you know, a Coca-Cola knows that that's coming from the Coca-Cola uh, company. It's going to taste a certain way. It's going to have a certain quality. Uh, and that uh, that arises over time and use. It, so sometimes people think they got a great idea and they just want to go run off and trademark it. And it's, well, a trademark is actually a source identifier. So sometimes people will say like, uh, I want to trademark God bless America or something like that. Well, maybe you could do that for a cup or something like that. But anyway, it has to be tied to a certain product. The trademark has to be kind of tied to a a product that consumers begin to recognize when they see the trademark, they know who the source is. If I see a God bless America <laughs> coffee cup, I have no idea who the source is. So um, just the, those, that's just kind of a general overview of these, these different areas and the different rights that you can get through following the process of protecting your intellectual property. Um, so in, um, uh, my world, I uh, do a lot of patent prosecution. So as I mentioned, there are two basic areas of patent law. There's the area of uh, patent prosecution. And what I'm doing there, as I said, is I'm negotiating with the examiner. That's what I'm trying to show in this slide is, you know, the, exam or the inventor has an idea. What we first have to do is prepare a patent application and it has to, you know, check certain boxes of enablement. You have to be able, uh, the skilled artisan has to be able to practice the invention just from reading your specification. And it has to be new and non-obvious. And if all those boxes get checked uh, and the examiner agrees, yes, those claims are new and non-obvious, then you would get an issued patent. And once you have the issued patent, that's when you can start to uh, enforce the property aspects of it, the exclusionary property aspects of it, of keeping people off of uh, your territory. And you would do that through patent litigation. If you found a product that you felt infringed one of the, the claims of your issued patent, you would go to court, uh, you would sue somebody and go to court if it didn't settle, of course, it 97% of the time settles. But, and you'd have a trial and the jury or maybe a, a judge, if there was no jury, would decide the outcome of uh, the litigation. And those outcomes could be uh, uh, two things. One is uh, that like, um, do not enter sign or whatever. That's like an injunction that's trying to symbolize you could get an injunction where you can block somebody from doing what they're doing. Or you could get uh, monetary relief, uh, depending on how many of these they sold, you might be able to get their profits, or you might be able to get the profits you could have gotten if they weren't infringing. Or sometimes, uh, oftentimes, I think the, the court would impose what's called a reasonable royalty, which is they assume you would have, these parties would have negotiated a reasonable royalty, uh, and then they award the damages but based on what that would have uh, been. <clears throat> and uh, here I'm just showing uh, the different steps of patent litigation. And the uh, main idea to take away from this slide is twofold. One is that patent litigation is um, complex. It takes about maybe a year and a half or two years before you get to the jury trial. But uh, in between that time, as I said, 97% of the cases are, are there about settle. They settle before they go to jury. So 
in these time in these leading up to jury moments this is really where the parties are getting a, an idea of the strength of their case and that's why the case is settled the parties begin to get an idea well i'm not i don't have the strongest case that i thought or i actually have a better case than i thought so people become a little more uh amicable to uh settlement versus going to the jury and just seeing what comes out of the jury is is pretty uh, risky you know um hard or i should say hard to predict um <clears throat> so w the way just to uh, let the audience know in case they ever get sued because a lot of times people want to know well what do i do if i get sued well um the first thing that would happen if you want to sue somebody you would be the patent owner and you'd file this complaint uh indicated off here on the left uh, and if somebody sues you, you'll receive uh, a letter or informing you that the complaint has been filed and you have one month uh, to uh, answer that. So that's really not much time at all to investigate the claim uh, of the complaint, come up with a kind of um, answer to that, uh, you know, usually a denial, I would expect, and um, and then you would uh, file maybe any counterclaims. Maybe sometimes uh, people have very large patent portfolios. So if you sue, sue them, maybe they sue you on some uh, other patents that they have, <clears throat> in which case you have some time to reply to that too. Uh, and then after this process has gone on, now this one month could be delayed. For example, sometimes people might sue you in an area you don't have any connection to. You might, uh, you would move to transfer venue. You could kind of slow this process down a little, but these timelines are kind of indicating, you know, smooth movement, but kind of uh, somewhat fast. It would usually, I think, be a little slower on each of these times for, for this because there will be motions like transferring the venue or something like that. But then the next uh, uh, point of the case is you would uh, meet, uh, the lawyers would meet with a judge and they would kind of plan out, okay, discovery will end at this time, experts, uh, you know, discovery ends at this next time. They kind of have this um, calendar of what, when things are going to be due. That gets set in this uh, case management conference. And at, at some point in the, and sometimes usually before, it depends on the court, but usually before the plaintiff would file their infringement contentions. And that's going to say specifically why they think that you in, infringe their claim. They're going to match up their claim to your product and say, look, all of these elements of my claim are found in this product. Therefore you infringe. And then the defendant can uh, file what's called invalidity contentions, which is just because you have a patent and you sue somebody, it's not smooth sailing. You, your patent is at risk. It could be invalidated. Uh, so that's another consideration people uh, bring into the calculation of whether they want to sue. They need to look at how strong their patent is. And what could make a patent weak? Well, if the claims are pretty broad and abstract, that could uh, fall. Uh, there's a section called 101 uh, w w where this comes up a lot of times with like, um, you know, uh, system claims or, or, or computer claims, processing claims. People can say this is just an abstract idea. You haven't tied it to any sort of apparatus or anything. Or <clears throat> if they could make that argument and convince the judge that you really uh, are trying to patent an abstract idea, your patent could get invalidated at that stage. Uh, and then the defendant can also make other invalidity challenges, but like it's not uh, new because then that's under section 102 and that's called uh, that the uh, invention has to be novel, but they would, uh, the defendant may claim, look, that same exact thing is in the prior art and here's the prior art. And hopefully for the defendant, that prior art hasn't been considered by the examiner, but if it's been um, considered by examiner, it's maybe more of an uphill battle. Um, but nonetheless, the patent is presumed to be valid in this whole proceeding. So the patent does have a little bit of an advantage in the sense that it's presumed, val presumed valid, but it, that advantage can be overcome by overcoming a burden of uh, persuasion to to show that, yes, this is non-obvious or, or I mean, this is obvious or whatever your invalidity contention is. And then at this five month mark, what's going to happen is actually a judge is going to have, this is what's called a Markman hearing is the judge actually gets to determine what the claims 
mean? Like, what is the uh, interpretation of each of these claim terms? So the judge will consider the plaintiff's interpretation and the defendant's interpretation and make a ruling. And this is a very critical time because this is really, depending on the ruling, this could um, make um, infringement almost a no-brainer where neither side is going to argue uh, maybe the construction is so narrow that it's clear that you're no longer infringing or the construction is broad enough to uh, bring you in. So this is a, a very critical time uh, that um, maybe helps the parties get an idea of the strength of their case if they're going to be able to do a, um, uh, a prevail in their infringement action. <clears throat> So after this claim construction opinion is given by the judge, the next part is they're going to um, have a summary judgment. That's where they'll make the the motions, like the defendant would would move uh, uh, for a summary judgment as in, in validity and non infringement, and that could end the case right there. If the if the judge rules in in the defendant's favor, that would be the end of the case. So again, there's a settlement time here where uh, you know it's. It's a good time to negotiate because it's going to probably be, if you lose on this uh, side, it's going to probably be more expensive or uh, if your motion gets denied. Uh, so this is just a, a general uh, overview. Patent litigation, it's complex. It has to be kind of uh, prompt litigation just because time is of the essence in, in this. And it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of issues that have to be covered before you even get to the jury trial. <laughs> So as I mentioned, a lot of people sometimes are concerned when they get these letters and they're getting sued. And so I have a little playbook up here. If if it ever happens to you, if you ever get a, a letter and you're getting sued for infringement, the first step really is to authenticate the threat because most of these threats that I have seen have been scams. Uh, frequently, uh, people will contact me and and they're worried and uh, uh They'll, they'll show me a letter that will say something like you infringe my uh, provisional patent or something like that. So, or a patent application, they'll show you something that looks like, oh, wow, that's a patent application. And it's got these big, broad claims. I definitely infringe that, but that's the patent application. That's what you filed. Those aren't the claims that got issued. You still had to have to go through the examiner and the examiner for sure uh, would probably narrow down those claims. And so you really can only be sued on an issued patent, um, patent publications, patent application, provisional patents that doesn't have any issued claims. There's actually no property rights in any of those things. But once you get an issued patent, now you have completed the process for, for that to get some of these property rights. So let's assume that you did go through that in the, that analysis and you looked and you, you determined, okay, this looks like it might be a, a real threat. Uh, there is a patent. What should I do? Well, uh, you should study the issued claims because uh, as I said, the, only the claims, issued claims can be infringed. So to do that analysis, what you would do is you would look at your product or use and you'd compare that to the claim that is being asserted against you. Uh, and you would say, okay, is every element of the claim found in the product or use? And if so, then uh, you are would be infringing. So a big part of this, though, is you have to keep track of how broad is the claim. So yes, every element has to be found in the product or use, but every element is... Uh, Kind of lawyer realm we can they can fight over every element they can say well what do you mean by wheel you know or something like that or what do you mean by frame you know um so just because it uh reads on your product that the, the battle's not over for sure you can uh start to argue areas about the claim scope what is the true meaning because as i uh, showed you before the actual claim construction is very important in the in the uh, patent litigation so just a little quiz, uh, make sure everybody uh, uh, is enthusiastic about patents as I am. Uh, let's just assume you were making this product over here. Uh, you're making this bicycle and somebody contacts you and they uh, say, hey, you're infringing my uh, claim from uh, issued patent, one, two, three, four, whatever it is. 
and they and you go and you check it out and this is the claim over here and it has uh it reads a transportation vehicle comprising and it has these uh elements so this is like I don't know if you uh, are familiar with patent language, but I'm so used to it that this makes sense to me. But anyway, comprising means uh, this first part here is the preamble. And what they're going to say is, what are we talking about? We're talking about that this thing is a transportation vehicle. Comprising means it includes the following things that are going to be listed. But that's not the end of the list. They, they, it could include more and it would still infringe, but it has to at least include these. That's what comprising means. So if we look over here at the product and uh, we evaluate this claim, um, I know it's kind of, it's, I, I won't put anybody on the spot if anybody wants to ring in to see if they, if it's uh, infringed or not, by all means, let me know, but I'll just go ahead and let you know that in this case, this is infringed. Yes, because if we look at these like arrows here, all these uh, elements are found in this bicycle. But again, as I said, if if you were my client and uh, you had this bad news, uh, it's not over because uh, you can try to find ways to say, oh, well, what is a handlebar configured to pivot on the two wheels? I mean, that actually, I'd probably be the, a tough one to get around on your product. But maybe you could say, um, you know, something about the seat or something. But you could find a way to see in the spec what they said. For example, say that... Uh, you look at your product and you say, oh, well, mine has a chain, mine has a basket. These things won't won't matter because they're not in the claim. So you can't point to things in your product and say, oh, but I have a whole, whole bunch of extra stuff. It's only going to be the analysis is only going to be is all the stuff in the claim found in your product. And if in this case it is. So in, in this case, your defense would have to uh, try to attack each of these elements or show that, for example, maybe you can show that this patent shouldn't have issued in the first place because you found a bicycle patent from 1800s or something, right? So <clears throat> you can still make the invalidity challenges, the non-infringement challenges would have to be based on uh, saying that these elements are not the way, as they are here in your product. But that, in this case, it would be a tough sell. But let's say we changed it up a little. Let's say that uh, instead of making bicycles, you're making tricycles. Okay, so in this case, uh, is the product in French? Does anybody have any ideas on that? Does anybody want to chime in? Nope, no ideas, no takers. That's good. Well, well, let me just walk through what maybe some people think. They're like. Maybe they think, well, this has three wheels and this says two. Okay, but uh, two wheels include, or I should say three wheels includes two wheels. It's two wheels plus one. And that's almost like a chain and a basket kind of extra thing. So I would say this again, yes, it infringes because, uh, you know, there's the two wheels and there's the seat and there's the frame and there's the handlebar. Now, this would be a better uh, case if you had, for example, the patent uh, that, that this claim came out of was only talking about bicycles. And perhaps you could get around the tricycle here by saying, no, no, these two wheels attached to the frame, the only way you disclose that where they were lined up one with, the, with each other, they had their axis parallel or rotation, but they were spaced apart from each other. You know, you could maybe make a way to say that none of these wheels, these wheels are arranged the same way. So... Again, I wouldn't want to have to go fight this fight uh, because two wheels is attached to the frame is what I see. But if I had to, I would kind of try to say these are not what was meant in the specification when they said two wheels. They, you know, this is what they disclosed. And if I had like a bicycle with a sidecar, uh, for sure, that would be more likely to be covered by that bicycle patent. But there are arguments where you could try to get out of this infringement, but it would have to be based on claim scope. And just a final one, this one's, uh, you know, we had two yeses, so this one's got to be a no, right? So here we have a basket added to the claim. There is no basket in the product. So this one would be no, because uh, there is no infringement, because a feature recited in the claim is missing in the product. That basket attached to the frame uh, does not appear in this tricycle picture. Now, again, if you were 
my client and we were trying to sue somebody uh, with this, we could say, no, there's a basket, right? And now again, this is kind of a stretch, but you could say, no, basket, that little like handlebar forms a basket or something like that. I mean, and you could maybe try to um, come at it that way by finding a basket in the product uh, or something that is within the claims uh, scope uh, of that element uh, of a basket attached to the frame. And then again, you, you, the other side, of course, will, would argue that that's, uh, uh, they would point out the weaknesses of that argument, I guess, would be a tough argument. So now, if you review the patent and uh, you, you authenticate the threat, you would review the patent, and now you need to know what's the risk, uh, because that's the other part of uh, uh, determining what to do is to see, well, what's what am I uh, risking by either ignoring this or continuing to do what I'm doing? And so for that, you would want to look at uh, what are the different possible damages uh, that could arise from patent infringement. If you were being sued for trademark infringement or uh, trade secret misappropriation, you'd want to estimate those damages. What, what are the damages that are the monetary uh, bill you could get stuck with if uh, the case doesn't go your way? And to do the real, uh, the, to do the total risk analysis, you also want to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of each side. And that's what's going on also during those litigation steps. So it's not only what money is at risk, but, you know, what is there like a 2% chance you could be on the hook for a billion dollars? I mean, that's still, I mean, or is it, you know, 90% chance you're going to be on, on the, hook for like you know twenty thousand. i mean you, you just kind of do that calculation to figure out uh well how how willing you are to uh risk uh being char uh, you know be having to pay some money but again that's going to be based on the strengths and weaknesses and that is based on the analysis of the claims and the the application so that's all this you want to be informed of that uh when you go to negotiate for example you want to if somebody's suing you, you want to be able to say, well, I can knock your patent out because of this, this, and this, or, you know, I don't infringe because of this, this, and this, or they say, yes, you do. Or the examiner looked at that art and already concluded that. And that's basically the, the ebb and flow of the negotiation that hopefully resolves before it gets to trial. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong button here. So here is just a list of uh, the remedies that are available for uh, all of the, each of these. This is patents, trademarks, copyright, trade secret. For each of these property rights, you could get an injunction, which is where the person has to stop doing what they're doing. Uh, and if you're sued for infringement, that could be a problem. Maybe you have a lot of inventory or something that uh, you haven't even sold any stuff. So you didn't accrue, you didn't... Uh, accrue monetary damages but you've invested a lot that now has to either be forfeited to the, your competitor or destroyed it could be a, a big uh, expense the other uh, damages you could get and these all have different kind of boxes that have to be checked so it's i'm not going to go into the details of them all but just to let you know that you could get what's called actual damages that's uh, the damages you suffered, sometimes that's called also referred to as lost profit. And that's basically what was the harm done uh, to the owner of the IP? You know, what's, what's the actual damages the IP owner suffered? The other possible monetary remedy you could get is the infringer's profits. Rather than doing uh, what was your harm, maybe what was their gain? What was the infringer's gain? And that's also referred to as unjust enrichment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if the court doesn't award um, or isn't able to calculate these, or maybe you don't qualify for some of the check, the boxes that need to be checked, you could get a reasonable royalty. Uh, most people are, are trying to get the actual damages and the um disgorgement of infringers profits but those are kind of tougher to get so reasonable royalty is a little bit broader for um, based on those check um, those box boxes that have to be checked um but uh it's maybe going to be less of an award than if you got those other two uh 
Another thing to keep in mind is that there's in each of these four, there's uh, the availability of enhanced or punitive damages. Uh, if you knew about a patent or a trademark or you, if somebody alerted you uh, and you continued to, to infringe or, or um, uh, misappropriate the trade secret or whatever it was, you could get enhanced uh, damages in the patents. It's like three times the damages. I'm not sure if that's true for all of them, but... But in any way, it's a factor that gets, it's a multiplying factor. So if you get 1.5 million, all of a sudden you get 4.5 million. That's a big uh, deal. <clears throat> and the, you can also get attorney's fees and costs. That's not really, uh, you, the attorney's fees can be uh, um, some uh, somewhat uh, expensive. The costs are pretty low. But again, attorney's fees are tough to get. Usually, I mean, if it's a case that, was reasonable, you won't get uh, attorney's fees. But maybe if somebody's just um, like um, fishing or whatever it's called, the trolling, or the, the, it's just like a nuisance case or something like that, you might, the, the filer of that complaint might get attorney's fees uh, awarded to the other side, to the defendant, if you're just filing kind of weak cases. And that last one, statutory damages, is uh, only available for copyrights. And it's, uh, I can't quite remember actually how much it is. I don't think it was so much, but, but, uh, okay. So now the, if you did have all this, uh, going, as I said, in the negotiations, you would want to know the weaknesses of the IP you're facing. So, uh, as I mentioned, like in the negotiating process, you want to maybe be able to tell somebody you can knock out their patent or their trademark is not, um, uh, valid or, or, or any of these things, uh, and that's what I'm highlighting here in this slide is, for example, in patents, um, sometimes rule 12B is you could, that's very early on. That's, uh, I think, like maybe that first motion, you, somebody files a complaint on you, you could uh, almost immediately file this motion uh, to say they, that this rule 12B, this uh, uh, failure to state a claim. And you would base that on, you know, that, the patent is invalid. I've seen uh, patents drop out at this stage on a 101 where somebody has a patent, they think it's a great patent, and then uh, the defendant claims, no, it's an abstract idea, uh, and they have dropped. I have seen uh, patents get invalidated at that stage, which is uh, uh, very bad for the plaintiff um, and probably a patent attorney that was advising the plaintiff. Um, and then, as I mentioned, summary judgments further down the road, you could get uh, patents knocked out at that point too by inv invalidity. And in fact, I wanted to talk about this one case, Minerva versus Hologic, uh, because this was a uh, public use case, in which case, if you, if you disclose your invention to somebody, you have one year to file your patent. You can file a provisional patent uh, um, or a full application, but you have to do it within one year of your disclosure. And what happened here in this Minerva case is they had developed a uh, technology for like cauterizing uh, uterine tissue. And they were showing this device around to just uh, as a lot of people would do to see if, what the market is and uh, whether or not it's even feasible to make money with this idea. And they found, yes, it's a great way, it's doing well. So then they filed their patent applications, but unfortunately they had waited too long uh, between the time of filing their patent application and doing that uh, kind of market research that when they did uh, go through the patenting process and they did get an, awarded a patent, they then sued with that patent, but the defendant was able to find uh, the disclosures that preceded their filing by more than a year. So that's a bar against getting a patent. So that patent drops uh, out uh, at that point. Um, there's also inter parties review. This is, uh, you know, uh, relatively new in the sense that, you know, I think 2013, they instituted this. Well, I guess it's not so new anymore. It's 10 years old. But this is a, another way that uh, people challenge patents frequently. You can file an IPR uh, after you get sued. I think you have like maybe a year to file an IPR. 
And in an IPR, you can challenge the patent, but you can only do it on 102 or 103 grounds, and that's new or non-obvious. So those are the two grounds that you can use when you challenge an IPR. Uh, there's other rules uh, as to what can be used. I think you can only use patent application and publications, uh, patent publications and applications to, to challenge it. Um, with trademarks, it's a similar kind of, you have this, window uh where you could uh challenge a, uh it's kind of like an ipr but it's like you could challenge the trademark at the t-tab the um uh trademark um board you could you could challenge your uh, trademark and if you're challenging the the other person's trademark within five years you can use almost any grounds i think like likelihood of confusion and descriptive things like that but once you've gone, once that trademark's been registered for longer than five years, there's only a, a limited number of grounds that you can challenge a trademark. And if you're not able to challenge it in the TTAB, you, of course, can litigate it, uh, its validity in federal court. Uh, trade secrets, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of times you can attack those by just showing any sort of activity that the uh, owner of that trade secret did that didn't maintain the secrecy of that alleged trade secret, such as uh, mailing uh, a customer list to a general population or something, <clears throat> or like a wide group of employees. It doesn't even have to be outside the, the company. It could just be showing that you, you never really protected this as a trade secret. Everybody had access to it or something like that. And uh, copyrights, uh, there is some, there's a fair use doctrine. You can use some of these uh, people's literary works within certain uh, realms. That's okay. And only another thing to note about copyright is that only the owner or the exclusive licensee uh, can sue. Of course, that's the same with patent. But what I mean to say is in a lot of the scams or whatever, the you may be accused of copyright infringement by somebody who's not the copyright owner or exclusive licensee in which case they're just probably fishing i mean they don't they don't have any right to sue you for somebody else's copyright and so that's just uh, a thing to keep track of is to know the different ways you can attack ip because if your analysis goes against you and you it looks like you might be infringing or something you can still have some uh ways to go after the ip itself so I'm just summarizing those points that I made throughout. If you're getting sued, the playbook is you would authenticate the threat, review the patent, and assess the risk. And uh, just if you ever find yourself in litigation, uh, you know, litigate promptly. Um, and if you're, when you're uh, analyzing infringement or something, just study the issued claims, you know, the weaknesses of the IP. Okay, I, before I move on, is there any questions for for patenting or what to do if you get sued or you want to sue anybody or is it okay if I just proceed into licensing agreements? Does that sound good for everybody? Um, I have a question in regards to that patent. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, in terms of uh, the new technology with AI, um, how would we be able to find out if that's the idea that they have is definitely or not? I'm sorry, it's very hard for me to hear. I don't know if oh, it's... I, I'm sorry, maybe it's me. Um, I'm talking about the AI technology. Yes. Yeah. Um, how would I um, find out if it's patentable or not? Um, it, if it's patentable? Be... If the AI yes. technology? That's actually a yes. topic that's pretty uh, new. I think that's really kind of coming. I see a lot of, uh, to of uh, talk about that, especially with regard to pharmaceuticals. I'm not too sure what their uh, uh, discussion is or what's going on in that, because the concern is that an inventor needs to be a person. It can't. Uh, so that I'm pretty sure that's the rule. I think that that's what they're talking about is that this AI cannot really be an inventor um, of whatever it finds. But again, you could be whoever programmed the AI. My under, I'm not an expert on AI, but my understanding of AI is it's not even AI. It's like, uh, like categorizing uh, information that already exists, but in a really extensive way. But um, I'm, I'm not an expert on AI. I just think that it is a topic that uh, 
that we need to, to have an actual person to be the inventor because invention is like a conception of an idea. And uh, so I, th I think that AI patents could be challenged for that very reason, right? I mean, if, if you could say, well, where did you get this molecule from? It came from your computer. So I am unfortunately not too uh, able to give you more direction than that, other than say the concern is over inventorship. Uh, and uh, uh, my understanding is it still needs to be a person that has to be the inventor. So that's kind of the discussion that's going on with AI right now. Um, thank you. Yeah, sure. Great question. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else? Okay. All right. So <clears throat> licensing is um, basically if you have uh, your exclusionary right, you get to decide who can do it. So a lot of times uh, people will license their patents or trademarks or any, you know, trade secrets even just to um, to other people to allow them to practice their the IP that belongs to the licensor. So the main thing to remember about licenses is that they are contracts. So, um, you should expect enforcement when you read them and when you draft them, when you enter into them, you want to make sure, could this be enforced? Uh, contracts in order to be enforced have to be very specific. We need to know who are the parties. Uh, we need to know, you know, maybe there's time constraints. When are they going to do certain things? Uh, that's what I'm showing in these little bubbles. Uh, maybe in the, in the lower left here, maybe there's extra documents that are referred to in the licensing agreement. Like you might be licensing patents and they're going to be attached as an exhibit or tr trademarks, or maybe even uh, referring to other agreements. This is this upper right-hand bubble. Or you might have a clause in there just saying how um, arbitration or, or disputes are going to be settled. You might have a, a form for choice of law or, or things like that. So you'll, in your licensing agreement, you'll have all sorts of clauses and I'll go through uh, at the end, kind of how it's structured and which clauses uh, you put in for different uh, things. But the main um, point is these are, are contracts and for a contract to be enforceable, a court needs to know exact numbers of like how much you should get and uh, how much was not paid to you and who owes it to you, who is the actual party that, um, uh, licensed uh, this uh, IP. So those are the uh, things to keep in the mind is make sure that the court reading the document can have specificity to enforce the document. So here are the key terms that uh, I have them listed A, B, C, D uh, uh, as they normally appear in a licensing agreement. <clears throat> There's a lot of licensing agreements online, uh, available online, and uh, if you read through them, you'll kind of get a, a sense of uh, maybe some good ways people state things and some not so clear ways that people th state things. Remember that we're looking for clarity since it's a contract. So usually you want to identify the parties right up front. You'll say, you know, not only their name, but their address, the date that they're signing this, so that if you say, well, who signed this? Well, you could go on this date at this address in the state of a corporation, this company, you, you should be able to find the person in the, uh, in the party. And uh, then you will have, after you have these, um, like kind of introduction of the parties, you have some wearing clauses or whereas clauses where you're just saying basically the purpose of the agreement, what each party is bringing to the agreement, um, you know, basically the setting of the agreement. And uh, then after that, you would move into uh, definitions. And now this is the thing about licenses is that, for example, you see how in, this, in the parenthetical of the definitions, all those um, uh, words are capitalized. The first letter is capitalized. And that's common in licensing and what that means is that term has a very specific mean, uh, a meaning and it can be found in the definitions. And whenever you use that term, you just want to use it consistently to make sure that, you know, for example, net revenue, you'd want to really describe what is net revenue because, you know, say somebody buys something and returns it, you know, or you gave a discount or who pays for shipping or I, I you know, you're going to want to have all of that 
kind of uh, spelled out in the definitions of what these different terms are uh, that you're going to use later on to calculate royalties and things like that. <laughs> and now uh, following the definitions, you'll often, oops, I'm sorry, following, you'll often have a grant of rights, which is going to say, uh, you know, exactly what is being uh, licensed. And it doesn't have to be like you license a whole patent to the, somebody. You might license only certain claims, or you might license only in trademark, you might only li license certain areas, geographic areas, or uh, you could do that even for patents. You could do that for pretty much everything. You could have geographic limitations, field abuse limitations. You could ex allow them to make it and use it, but not sell it. Uh, all sorts of uh, options in the grant of rights. And um, you can have cross licensing if you guys, if, if you have your uh, licensing uh, with each other, like, you know, the, the trading IP back and forth. And then you can have grant backs if you license fully to somebody and they improve it, uh, you get maybe access to their improvements and things like that. Uh, following that, you have basically uh, what is going to be the payment the for, for that right, those grants of right. And, you know, you might have a running royalty, might have a lump sum, you could have what it whatever way you want to set it up you could have tech support costs in there um and uh moving over to the next uh panel you would then talk about payment how is that actually gonna how are you actually going to pay that consideration some of the, like you know the, the nuts and bolts of the of the agreement there might be restrictions you might want to call out in the license just because it never hurts that just because you didn't grant it, you might want to say specifically, I did not grant you this, right? Like we grant you the make and use, but not to sell. You could actually spell out some of the limitations, however you want, um, just to be very clear in case it has to be enforced. Uh, and just finishing off the list, confidentiality, a lot of times, uh, um, you might want to define uh, what is what is confidential, uh, what is not, how long is it confidential, because maybe after your license ends, you still expect them to keep confidential information confidential. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's enforcement rights. You could say where you're going to uh, um, litigate in court, uh, things like that. Uh, future IP is, a, is an important one for patents, right? If there's developments in the product or in the technology, you want to have responsibility and payment kind of spelled out who's going to own that, who's going to uh, be responsible for paying for the patent prosecution um, and termination clauses uh, for, for, you know, if the license goes wrong and, and those you were going to want to have in there, like, for example, say you license it to somebody who's not doing anything. Maybe you want to set a minimum of if, if you don't, meet this goal in this amount of time licensor has options to cancel the license and give it to somebody else uh, um, those kind of things and then the last you know there's often a lot of boilerplate and other provisions with severability arbitration i mean governing law is not boilerplate but you might want it. but severability and uh, entire agreement these are kind of almost boilerplate um, things that they put in just so that if one part of the contract falls, the whole contract doesn't fall apart, you can just knock out that one part and allow the court to interpret the rest of the agreement. And uh, normally I'm putting up a slide here that just shows, uh, you know, I found this on the WIPO uh, website about uh, royalties for different uh, industries. And and what in my, my work I've actually seen a lot of five and six percent royalties so i just think that might have just been kind of because i wasn't in the chemical industry or, or actually i don't know that still looks around five and six percent but some of these get up quite high 10 to 15 percent in pharmaceuticals uh looks like it gets even in a small number of cases gets to be quite high but i think five to six percent is pretty standard for for most licenses um and that looks like it's holding up on this slide. That must be true. Uh, I think I, I mentioned this just briefly, just a moment ago in, uh, in regard to the patent world, uh, it's important to plan for improvements, uh, just include terms that if somebody makes an improvement, they promptly disclose it to the other party and that you have sorted out who's gonna own that right, uh, who's gonna be obligated to seek protection for it. 
and uh, hopefully uh, you can have grant back licenses and things like this so that if somebody develops a new type new technology you, the licensor can get it back or if the licensor develops new technology they can pass it on to the licensee and in trademarks uh, licensing you're actually going to want to have a kind of different set of terms in trademarks it's really important to keep track of like over sight of the producer like you want to have quality control issues like inspection because the trademark that's what it stands for the source identifier so if you license out your trademark and you don't uh, identify or keep track of how they're producing it or whatever it could invalidate the trademark because it could just say well it's, you're not using it as a source identifier you're just using it almost as like a like a text name or something because you're not ensuring that the quality uh, adheres to a certain standard you're just kind of licensing it out to whoever wants to produce it so that your trademark could get invalidated for for that kind of um, failure to you know protect your own trademark and, and ensure high quality products okay so i think that's it for me again thank you philip uh, and thanks to jj and thank you all for attending if you have any questions or anything i'm happy to answer any thank you mike i really appreciate it this was really helpful mm -hmm. uh i i learned a lot i have some questions too mm -hmm. uh but i thought i'd uh, open it up to other people here who can ask questions first mm -hmm. so if you have a question unmute yourself and ask away Okay, well, I'm gonna ask my question. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> uh, so, um, and maybe this gets the ball rolling. So, um, obviously, there's gonna be elements in your patent that are patented already. So, I'm sure, for example, in the bicycle example, someone has a patent on a wheel mm -hmm. or someone has a patent on a frame. So, are you infringing on someone else's patent if you come up with a new concept that uses other people's uh, products? Yeah, so that is, that's a good point. Uh, you would be, yes, you could be, because a lot of times what happens is the patent gives you the right to exclude other people from practicing your invention, but that doesn't mean it gives you your the right to practice your invention, because you could be in the territory like you're describing, you're within the realm of somebody else's uh, IP. So you get, you maybe get a um kind of like a narrow scope within their bigger uh like area of ip you get a, a smaller portion and you can exclude them also from coming into your portion it's strange it doesn't really line up like a venn diagram you know like they maybe couldn't per say you invented that chain or something right then maybe they couldn't put a chain on their bike but they could still have your bike and then normally what would happen is that's when licensing would come in or cross licensing if you kind of convince them we can sell a ton of bikes with chains you know uh uh so let's team up together and then maybe the parties will negotiate a cross license where uh they can share their IP to uh, develop the product and then share in the profits. But yeah, you could definitely be in a, you could have a patent that just because you get it still infringes another patent. Yeah, because I'm thinking even even each element, like even every nut and bolt, mm -hmm. it's got to be uh, something that has been patented. <laughs> well, yeah, and then that's why things eventually enter into the public domain. So, so a lot of those patents are probably expired. Uh, uh, you get, I think, like, you know, 17 years or, or something like that. I should know that. But anyway, <laughs> you get that, you get a certain amount of time, 20 years from filing. I actually do know this. <laughs> uh, you get 20 years from filing your application on your uh, patent term. You could get it extended if there's delays in the patent office and things. But that's kind of like the nuts and bolts will maybe coming back into the into the public domain. Although if you're using a specific nut or bolt, you could be back into infringement area, you know, if there's some some technology there that's relatively new okay okay um thank you uh yeah I'm, sure i'm gonna uh anybody else with questions okay well i'm gonna ask another one then okay sounds <laughs> good <laughs> so if you have a um if you have an idea for a company 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and you see it, you see a way of improving. And uh, maybe it's, I'm not sure if it would be like a copyright or something of that sort, but what if, um, how would I protect myself if I wanted to go to that big company and then say, hey, I have an idea. And um, how do I protect myself so that they don't just say, hey, that's a great idea. Thank you. Hang up the phone on me and uh, walk away with, uh, you know, making millions of dollars. I mean, is there a way for me to, if I have an idea for them, to protect myself if I want yes. to call them? Yeah, for sure. That's uh, if you could use a couple things. One is a non-disclosure agreement. You could uh, ask them to sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, before you reveal your idea to them. But large companies usually won't do that because they're usually working on a lot of things and they don't want to say that that they're not already working on this kind of thing. Just that, that's normally what they may be. I, I don't think they usually su- sign those. But what you would also do is sign, uh, you can file a provisional patent, which is relatively cheap to do uh, on your if you if it was a patented technology. If it's a trademark, it's a uh, uh, again I, I would file the trademark, but it's a source identifier, so it's a little bit different uh, with them stealing the idea. But you could you could also file the trademark with the intent to use it, and then you have a certain window to start to use the trademark so that they don't steal your like cool name or whatever it is um but if you don't use it then you would it could you could lose lose the trademark um so yeah and then if you didn't if you didn't get a company to sign a non-disclosure agreement i i would recommend you file a provisional patent because they're the filing fee on that is relatively cheap i think it's only like 150 dollars or something like that and it's not too much to prepare because it can be very rough. It's not going to go to an examiner. It's almost just putting it in the file cabinet of the patent office in case you had to go back to it. You could say, no, I filed that earlier and, and show them. And it will remain confidential. It has like a one-year window where you can convert it to an application. And then it would would publish if, it, if, if you went on that way. But if you just put it in and then realize actually it's not a fully developed idea. I don't even want it to publish. If you just leave it at the provisional standpoint, it won't even publish. It'll just be confidential to, to you. And that would also be, the, um, I could also do a copyright as well, or just really with a new product idea. It's a, yeah. it's a provisional patent. Well, copyright just arises naturally. If you actually just make your own uh uh material or something you still people copyright it and register it so that they could sue for infringement but you actually do have that right if you can prove that you uh reduced it to a medium you know this literary work which you would i would assume be able to do through files and stuff on your own uh you're going to be able to a copyright will arise just of its own accord from your authorship but if you want to license it or anything you would have to register it but i think registering the copyright is pretty quick it's not it's not too difficult to do that excellent thank you Mm -hmm. sharon i see your hand is up so uh, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question sure mine is on copywriting Mm -hmm. um a copywriter a patent i have a name which i came up with Mm -hmm. and would you suggest to copyright it versus getting a trademark I know trademark may be yeah. a little more in depth yeah it depends uh if you intend to use it like for a product then um you you could go for a trademark with an intent to an intent to use uh with a copyright although it does these rights do arise naturally they're really pretty uh limited to what you produce so for example if you write a brochure and you explain how to use some product or something that is copyrighted and that's kind of uh specific that they would infringe if they take the text out of there and they're or they're or they're republishing if you just have like one phrase like a like a brand name or some sort of new name you could you could copyright it, but it'd only be really kind of however you artistically drew it or however it is. Uh, maybe if you have a logo or something, you could copyright that. Um, uh, if you're developing your trait, you could maybe do both. You could develop your logo and and copyright it. You can also um, get it. Uh, you can trademark you can trademark a logo as well. So both of those would work for a brand it's just that in the trademark realm you're going to eventually have to be um uh producing a product to to enforce it to actually get it 
to the place where you could enforce it, it has to be a source identifier. And with the copyright, if it's just a name, like a brand name, I don't know that you could stop people from doing that unless it's a, that they're doing the brand name the way you specifically did it when you created your kind of artistic. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. Also with uh, promotions, mm -hmm. um, if you were to use someone's music, are there any, what other regulations on that? Yes, yes. Uh, for and that's really what copyright uh, is going to protect is like if you use somebody's music in like your promotional ad or something, you'll want to get their permission because now uh, copyright they the copyright owner can sue you if you're kind of, if you're getting economic gain out of their copyrightable material. That's what they can actually recover. So if you're using it in business, for sure, that's running a risk. The fair use doctrine uh, is like maybe if you're doing a commentary or you're just like doing a review and you cite a little bit of their work and just, you know, maybe summarize what they did, that's a fair use. But if you're making money off of like replicating what they did, uh, you're just using like maybe their promotional material or something like that, then that's risking infringement because uh, you're making an economic gain off of their um, copyright. Okay. Um, I know there is a agency for biggest actors mm. guild or something like that or creator mm. for music and you can pay to you know use their music yeah would, yeah that would make sense because i kind of i'm not in i don't do much of the media uh copyright stuff but i i do think that's how they would have to have it organized is like there's some sort of <laughs> um uh system that kind of knows who's playing what what you know how many times the song's going or or whatever it is, I think they have a whole agency or network set up to kind of monitoring uh, what's being used. So they think kind of runs the royalty, like they keep track of the royalties or things like right. that. Right, I don't, I don't, the royalties. Yeah, exactly, the royalties. I'm not sure how that works, but yes, it, there is a system in place that's keeping track of uh, the royalties on that. Okay. I heard too, you can't, um, I'm into the food business. Mm. Um, you can't um, trademark a recipe or copyright. Yeah, recipe. yeah, you can't. You you might be able to copyright like a recipe book or something like that. You you, you a lot of times people try to patent recipes. I know you can't. It's very difficult to patent a recipe because how do you prove nobody ever mixed those ingredients in that way or something? That it's just it's very difficult to patent a recipe, but. You could copyright like a recipe in the way that it's laid out in the page format or something like that. Um, uh, but as far as like stopping somebody from making bread the way you make bread, I don't think you can, you wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, and the trademark yeah. again, is just, uh, is uh, your, your brand itself has to stand up based on its source. So it's not so much like your trademark bread is, because it has some proprietary um, recipe. It's more like you are watching and keeping track of everything and making sure the high quality standard is being met. Yeah, I know um, I worked with H&R Block and um, mm -hmm. Liberty for a while mm -hmm. and you could not work with them and then go work with someone else mm -hmm. yeah. um, within, gosh, a certain radius yeah yeah, yeah i know yeah 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 there's sometimes people will do that like uh non-compete agreements or something but in california that's pretty hard to enforce i think that it that would be state maybe state dependent on yeah non-compete yeah 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 i think the state regulates that and california mm -hmm. i think those are pretty hard to enforce you get to yeah. a lot of leeway there I heard the story, that's how um, Liberty Tax got started is he was partnering with H&R Block mm. and they broke up. So he had to mm. do a non-compete for 10 years. He went in Canada right on the border of the U.S. Uh, oh, okay. Started up after the 10 years over, he came right there yeah. and down and uh, he's, they, they're doing well. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Good.
Okay, well, thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, Any my nephew questions? is an artist. He's a, he's a musical artist. Oh, cool. That's awesome. I, I help him sometimes with his taxes. <laughs> yeah, my background is in finance. Oh, good. Operation and tax accounting. All right, that's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, again, Mike, thank you so much for your expertise and uh, for educating us. I sure. really appreciate it. I, yeah, on behalf you. of Cal State Fullerton, we, we thank you very much. Yeah, um, with that, we're going to be starting, uh, for those of you uh, left on the call, uh, we're gonna be starting up our summer series of guest speakers, and that's gonna be happening at the end of the month and continuing throughout the rest of the summer. So um, we hope to uh, see you again. And uh, for now, I will say good night to everyone. Again, thank you. Thank you, Mike, appreciate right. it. Thanks, thank you, Phil. Okay, good night, talk everyone. to you all later. Good night, everyone. Bye -bye. Goodbye.